is Terence Curran. I'm academic from the United Kingdom, and much of my sub research in the last decade has been on academic I should like to thank Professor Esther Caro for inviting me to visit the university to make this address. Now, in Europe, not much has been written on academic freedom, either of staff or indeed of students. By contrast, In the United States, academic freedom is protected by the First Amendment to the American Constitution, which protects freedom of speech. Which means that it is a contested concept insofar as it is repeatedly reinterpreted by the Supreme Court. Much of this debate tends to look at the benefits of academic freedom, but there's been very little empirical work to substantiate all of those beliefs. Moreover, very little work has been undertaken on students' academic freedom. And in this presentation, I have tried to critically consider the differing elements of academic freedom and also to suggest some specific freedoms that might be granted to university students. However, my first slide has nothing at all to do with academic freedom. Now, here you can see this is Satan in hell. He's interviewing a demon for a new job. And Satan says, I need someone well versed in the art of torture. Do you know PowerPoint? The idea being that seeing PowerPoint is a torture, and I realise that it can be. Having said that, I also am aware of the fact that I have to get through a huge amount of information in a short period of time because I'm not in training. So please don't try and take notes. I will be giving the presentation to Esther and certainly to everyone. So you don't need to write him down, you can fold your arms and just read what's on the screen and I will provide a narrative to that. However, towards the end of this particular session, I'm going to ask you to log into this particular URL and then give your opinion on questions that relate to some of the proposals on academic freedom. So this will give you a chance to actually actually actively participate in the class and it will be interesting to see what your opinions are on these various facets of academic freedom of students. So that comes a bit later on. Now we come into the session proper. Uh, the presentation is structured as you can see around six major themes. Firstly we will look at academic freedom and see how it might be defined. Then we'll examine the historical roots of academic freedom, looking at Italy, but also France and Germany. After that, using the UNESCO 1997 recommendation, will enable us to look at the constituent elements of academic freedom and identify them. Having done that, we will then ask, well, why is academic freedom important and to whom? We will then move on to look at some initial ideas on academic freedom that I will present. At every step of the way, the emphasis will be on critiquing our knowledge of academic freedom, rather than just providing you with information. So the idea is that we look at the different elements and we will critique them. Here we have a quotation given by Albert Einstein in 1933. In the 1930s, the Nazi party started to issue a decree which meant that leading academics had to leave the country, including Einstein himself and most of the United States. And this speech was given at a fundraising event in London. Now, Einstein himself passionately believed in the idea of academic freedom. But as you can see from the quotation, he also considered that, as well as protecting academics, it also should protect poets and playwrights like Goethe and also Shakespeare. Hence, Einstein was concerned with freedom of artistic expression and not just academic freedom. Now, we can see from this slide that academic freedom is often mentioned in international agreements. And I've got two here, one from the Council of Europe and one from the European Union. Such documents, however, although they're issued with honourable intentions, rarely provide a good description of academic freedom. And in consequence, they have very limited utility with respect to academics themselves and also students when it comes to the concept of academic freedom. 
Most nations provide a definition of academic freedom and its protection. For example, in Ireland, the 1997 Universities Act does that. Unusually, some nations consider academic freedom to be so important they include it in the national constitution. And you can see that from these two examples from Spain and Greece. The Spanish protection for academic freedom sees it as being different from freedom of speech, which it is. In Greece, there are limits to academic freedom, although the constitution said that academic freedom exists. So, for example, in Greece, it is not possible for you to research and publish information that has, or could put, Greece's fighting forces under any duress. You can't do that. So, although academic freedom is definitely protected, there are still limits to it. Now, although academics agree academic freedom is important, if you ask, if ask any academic, they would say yes, it is important, they can't really agree on what constitutes academic freedom or indeed how to protect it. My own research in Europe and elsewhere shows that most academics do not know about the protection of academic freedom in their own countries. They even less know about international regulations. On this slide, you can see some very typical statements made by academics about the importance of academic freedom. And if you read these carefully, you can see they all suggest that trying to produce a coherent and accurate definition of academic freedom would be difficult, if not impossible. However, it is very difficult to argue for the protection of a particular legal concept if you are unable to define it. Although there are some variations, between nation states, it is evident that the structures of universities, faculties, departments, etc., and also the learning activities, lectures, seminars, tutorials, across the globe are very similar. They have lectures in universities in Japan, just as they do here, just as they do elsewhere in Latin America. So it should be possible to derive some common characteristics. Indeed, most of my work has centered on the possibility of codifying and actually trying to measure academic freedom. Now, the 1997 recommendation on the status of higher education teaching personnel is generally regarded as being the most thorough and healthy definition of academic freedom that there is. The recommendation was signed by all 182 members of UNESCO. One major country that did not sign it was the United States, because the then president, Ronald Reagan, withdrew the United States from UNESCO because he believed it had a bias in favor of the Soviet Union. And I was believed it was a communist organization. The United States rejoined UNESCO in 2002, but they never signed a recommendation, which is a shame because it would be interesting to see how the course would have held. Academic freedom is a professional freedom. It is granted to enable university staff to undertake their academic duties, of research. So academic freedom is similar to, but not identical with, freedom of speech. Most experts would also argue that academic freedom includes or carries a duty of care towards students. However, academics are very vocal in protection of their academic freedom, but they're much less likely to reciprocate and say that they do have a duty of care for students. The reciprocal of academic freedom is academic duty. There have been hundreds, if not thousands, of books written on academic freedom. I only know of one whose title is Academic Duty. So that shows you what academics have been concerned with. Academic freedom only operates inside the university. There are no legal or moral reasons for allowing academics greater protection of freedom of speech outside the university in order to voice their opinions on topics outside of their subject expertise. So for example, Esther knows about academic freedom. She can talk about that outside the university, but she wouldn't necessarily have academic freedom if she then was to talk on a completely different to topic like, I don't know, engineering, in which she has no expertise. Any academic voicing an opinion outside the university needs to ensure that he or she explicitly states that they are speaking as an individual and not as a member of the university. Because academic freedom is a professional, professional freedom, it will not come outside the university. Right, we 
now look at the historical roots of academic freedom in Italy, France, and Germany. So, the development of universities in Europe was a spontaneous movement and not the result of any careful planning. Students gathered around teachers or resorted to famous schools attached to cathedrals in centres that became known as studio. Formalisation of the powers and duties of these institutions started with the Authentica Habita, enacted by Emperor Barbarossa in 1155, which provided protection for scholars travelling to seats of learning. Bologna University in Italy received a charter in 1158, but in the 19th century, historians traced the birth of the university back to 1088, making it the oldest university in Europe, if not the world. In the early days of these universities, the role of students was crucial to their survival. In Bologna, for example, autonomy was vested in the student universitas. The students, in fact, paid the salaries of the teaching staff directly. And they also appointed a rector from among the students. In examination of candidates for degrees, the authority of the masters, the teaching staff, was absolute, but in all other matters, the students were supreme. The city of Bologna itself tried to control the university, and in 1217, the university held the town of Bologna to ransom by withdrawing from the town, until its demands for greater control over the stadium were met. In fact, throughout the lifetime of universities, there have been threats from both town and gown, Pope, for example, also other authorities with respect to academic freedom. And quite frequently, academics have voted with their feet, which are now come on to with respect to Paris. But also from Paris, staff went to Oxford, from Oxford they went to the United States, and in that way, academic freedom and universities were spread across the globe. So, University of Paris. The University of Paris was founded in the mid 12th century. And autonomy was considered in terms of freedom to teach, and therefore it applied directly to the professors rather than the students. In 1229, there was a celebration of Lent in which the guards of the province of Paris killed some students. Masters called for an end to classes to protest this like blatant violation of academic privilege. The university said it can only resume lectures if the civic authorities made compensation. They didn't, so there was a great dispersion of masters and students from Paris, in fact, to Orleans and also to Oxford. We now move on to Humboldt. Wilhelm von Humboldt is, I suppose, very, very important when it comes to the modern idea of academic freedom. In his memorandum of 1810, on the organisation of the new University of Berlin, he laid down the modern principles of academic freedom. It is evident that the intellectual core of the Humboldtian model were not his own invention. Nevertheless, this model has been instrumental in defining academic freedom in the modern era, both in Europe and the world. More importantly, a significant part of his work was centred on the idea of freedom for students. There were four principles in the Humboldtian University. Firstly, we have Lehrfried, which is the recognition that professors were free to do research and report their findings in lectures or publications. The emphasis on research in the German University marked it as being different from the preceding models of both Italy and France. As professors were salaried civil servants paid by the government, they had some form of employment protection. Indeed, in some countries in Europe, Spain's a good example, professors are still employed by the government rather than by the university. Humboldt's recognition that academic staff need to have the freedom to teach and research was widely recognised, not only in Europe but also in the USA, where it formed the basis for the modern university. The other aspect of Humboldt's conception was that of learn for him. This is learning freedom for students who had control of their choice of courses of study and were free to move from place to place to sample different academic objects. This meant freedom to learn, freedom to study what one wished, freedom to go from university to university, freedom to attend a class or stay at home if you wished, 
In short, we need to rub one's own mind. The next element was free de Wissenschaft. This was the right of academic self-governance and institutional autonomy. So universities could make their own decisions on internal matters under the direction of the faculty. This aspect of academic freedom has come under attack in many universities in Europe, where the move towards making universities part of the knowledge economy has led to managerialism in universities, which has undermined academic freedom. The final element that Humboldt used was the idea of the unity of teaching and research and the collaborative pursuit of these by staff and students. In other words, university teaching aided both the lecturer and the student as true knowledge emerged in the interplay between the experience of the professor and the enthusiasm of the student. And it is hoped that in most universities, this is still how teaching is undertaken. So those are the elements of his model. This particular model was then taken up and is still present in many of the states of Europe, more particularly in Northern Europe. In 1876, the Johns Hopkins University in the United States was founded using Humboldt's model. And in consequence, it became the model for all other research universities in the United States and indeed <coughs> So, we're now going to look at the constituent elements of academic freedom. I mentioned the recommendation on the States of Higher Education Teaching Personnel, and here it is here. The actual recommendation stated the right for education, teaching, and research can only be fully enjoyed in an atmosphere of academic freedom. Now, if you read the document, it is very, very detailed, but not very helpful as a day-to-day -day guide with respect to academic freedom and whether it has been infringed. So, the recommendation provides detailed protection in five areas. Institutional autonomy, individual freedom firstly of teaching and secondly of carrying out research, self-governance and the ability to rule oneself, and also tenure, in other words, employment protection. There is, in fact, a committee established by UNESCO which checks to see whether in certain countries these principles are actually being followed. As you can see from this slide, academic freedom comprises substantive and supportive elements. The substantive elements are the freedom to undertake teaching and research. These are underpinned by three supportive elements, autonomy, shared governance and employment protection. The way in which these operate varies between country to country. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, we have no tenure. It was abolished in 1988. In Sweden, there is a law that protects academic freedom for research, but no protection for, us, for uh, teaching. In Malta, there's no legal protection for academic freedom either for teaching or for research. This slide shows the activities most usually associated with the freedom to teach. However, the extent to which these freedoms can be enjoyed will vary from nation to nation, from university to university. In fact, in the United Kingdom, the law there says that it is the university rather than the teaching staff that have the freedom to determine the contents of courses and the way in which they are supervised, taught and assessed. So in the United Kingdom, academic freedom for teaching is subservient to the university's control. So, is this freedom justified? I've got here some quotations too from Martin Diamond and other than Martin Betty Collis. The point is that other than academics who work in departments of education, most university teachers do not have a strong knowledge of learning theory and may have very limited experience of writing, for example, open and disciplinary materials. In addition, most teachers use very traditional methods of assessment. This may have altered because of COVID, which forced many universities to teach online. It's worth posing the question, is it wise to give academics the power to determine how a course may be taught when they may not know the best way to teach? Most academics are not given training in teaching. 
it is just assumed they will develop this knowledge by some kind of osmotic process. It doesn't always happen like that. Diana Laura's quote, I think, is a very good one. We all remember the good teachers of university because there were so few of them. And I must admit that, uh, I imagine that echoes your experience, it definitely echoes my own. Freedom for teaching. Sorry, I can't go away. Freedom for research. Here we have the various aspects in relation to freedom of research. Again, as with teaching, these freedoms will vary considerably between different nation states, different universities, and even different departments. So, for example, in Italy, the law says that academics cannot be forced to undertake research into areas that may come against their conscience. The Danish university law indicates that it is up to the department to determine the research <coughs> So in that sense, they do not have academic freedom to undertake research. With respect to research, I think most people agree that academic freedom is essential to research and there are various ways in which this can be evident. I've mentioned here the work by Russell, Principia Mathematica, he actually spent two years producing this book, but without this book, modern computing would have been impossible. He was, however, removed from his post twice. Once because of his opinions on the First World War, and second because of his views on marriage. If we look nearer at the discovery of DNA, both Craig and Watson at Cambridge were told to stop doing their research by Bragg, their head partner. But they claimed academic freedom and went on researching DNA and were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1962. And DNA has revolutionized, for example, medicine, but also forensics. But is academic research justified? There are about 30,000 scientific journals worldwide, and close to 2 million articles are published every year. However, most of these articles, once published, will never be referenced again although they've been published. And indeed, some of the topics for research articles are quite simply not really worth, I think, publishing. On this slide, at the bottom I've got a Wikipedia link, <coughs> this looks at a journal article produced by two research fellows at Cambridge, and they decided to do research into how to tie a tie, <coughs> which is obviously very important to gentlemen, how do you tie a tie. And they concluded there are 85 ways of tying a tie. They spent a year and a half doing this and published it. I mean, this has had no impact at all. So it may be that some research may not be justified. And bearing in mind it's public money that has to be spent on it, you'd have to have a very good reason. Autonomy. Individual autonomy relates to the ability of academics to undertake teaching and research, as we've said. But it also includes other activities, including governance. Institutional autonomy is different. It's the ability of the university to make strategic and day-to-day -day decisions regarding the university. Increased managerialism within universities in Europe and elsewhere has weakened the ability of individual academic staff to exercise governance, with the result that institutional autonomy has then altered, reduced academic freedom for staff. Much is made of academic freedom at degree ceremonies and by rectors and presidents. And I've got one here from King Brewster. You can see here the spirit of academic freedom has a value going beyond protecting, etc. etc. Having said that, greater institutional autonomy that universities have enjoyed in recent years has reduced the academic freedom of individual academics. There's no dispute. So is this freedom justified? I think we'd all agree that universities do have to be responsible and accountable to governments to give them large sums of money to undertake research. Having said that, if academics maybe had more academic freedom, they would make discoveries that were more important and vital than research that's commissioned by governments and also increasingly nowadays by industry. <coughs> Governance. Governance is the freedom of staff to voice their opinion on university policies, to have a determined voice in decision making, 
and also to appoint people into managerial positions, which can be quite critical. Shared governance means that all major policy decisions within universities are debated and evaluated, so that any mistakes by the university's senior managers are minimised. In some universities, in some nations, the university's main decision-making body includes representatives not only from the teaching staff, but also from the non-teaching staff, and even from the students. In other countries, however, representation of non-teaching staff and students may be non-existent, and staff may have only a limited input into decision-making. I had a student from Saudi Arabia who undertook a study of academic freedom in Saudi Arabia and sent out 2,000 surveys to get people's opinion. It was the case in Saudi Arabia that although academic freedom did exist, input into governance was negligible. Governance was in fact run by the government of the university. So they had no recovery soil. So most universities appoint their, uh, sorry, have some form of self-governance by a elected body like the Senate. The role of academic staff, however, has tended to decline and co-option of uh, other members on the board of industry now occurs. So, for example, in Finland, universities have a board of directors with 11 members. Five members, however, come from industry and they have no knowledge of academia whatsoever. But it is thought by having them there, the university will be more likely to attend to the commercial aspect of its activities. In the past, rectors were internal appointments chosen from the senior professors. In no other profession that I know, be it medicine, the law, architecture, etc., is it the case that staff have an input into government's decisions or indeed can directly criticise senior management? This only seems to happen in academia. Many would argue now that the growing marketisation of universities means that they now provide a product and the students are customers rather than clients. And that in that sense, they buy an education in much the same way as they may buy a car. Tenure. Tenure is the right of academics after <coughs> successfully completing a period of probation to be given a situation where their employment is protected and they cannot be sacked for speaking out, only for due cause. In the United States and Canada and many EU countries, academic staff are granted employment after a probation period and cannot be removed from their jobs without due process. I don't know if that's the case in Italy, is it? You have tenure in Italy? We have tenure at the later <coughs> stage when, right. you, when you become associate professor. But you were, in former times you have tenure also when you became researcher, lecturer, right. but no longer. Right. Okay, that's similar to the rest of Europe. So is it right that we should give people tenure? It's been argued by various people that academic tenure in encourages academic staff to ignore their responsibilities to students because they can't be sacked. In the US, only very few academics have ever had their tenure revoked. In the UK, as I mentioned previously, our tenure was removed in 1988. And it is definitely the case that this has increased managerialism in UK universities. Research looking at the impact of tenure has failed to reveal that academics tend to do less work once they have tenure. It's just not true. So, having looked at the different elements of academic freedom, we now ask, well, why is it important? Because if it's not important, we wouldn't wish to protect it. Supposedly, academic freedom is important to universities. It's necessary for universities and their staff to be able to undertake research and disseminate the results of their research through their teaching. Also, I've got here the New Zealand Education Amendment Act. In New Zealand, at least, universities are held to fulfil the function of acting as the critic and conscience of society and to hold governments to account. Academics repeatedly say academic freedom is essential to the university. Having said that, if I look at Saudi Arabia, which my student did, 
Academics there still had academic freedom. There were no disputes about academic freedom, however, because there was no teaching in contentious areas. So if you were living in Saudi Arabia, you could not do a degree in politics. They don't exist. For that reason, you would not criticize the regime. Most of the courses in Saudi universities are related to the national economy, and more particularly to extractive industries, oil and gas. So academic freedom doesn't really come to the fore, because there are no points at which the government might be criticized. But is it true that academic freedom is important to universities? It's argued that universities now occupy a primary role in the creation of a national global economy. And their success in this role is vital for national prosperity. The shift towards marketization of education means that universities now act much more like private firms than like public institutions. I undertook a study of 200 universities in the United States, and we found that public universities still protect academic freedom. Private not-for-profit universities like Yale and Harvard, they also protect academic freedom. However, Private for profit universities, like for example the Trump universities, offer no protection of academic freedom and often hire the academics pretty much by the hour. It has been argued that the importance of university to the national economy is now so great that we should set academic freedom aside just to ensure that universities can engender better prosperity for the nation state. What about students? How important is academic freedom to students? Well, you should know better than me in that sense. Research, however, has shown that constraints on academic freedom may be a factor in declining teaching standards and student grades, and an emphasis on safer rather than challenging research. It is clear that if the syllabus and teaching methods are less challenging at one university than at others, then a degree from that university will be worth less than the degree from the university can have higher protection for academic freedom and higher academic standards. But is it true that academic freedom is important to students? Many students, especially those paying fees, now adopt a consumerist approach to their studies. And the growth of this approach has created an approach to learning in which students place more emphasis on consumer rights than on their academic responsibilities and are more concerned with getting a good degree to secure a job rather than the transformative process of being a learner. And in that sense, academic freedom for students has altered. In the United Kingdom, we have students who pay £9,000 in fees and they expect to get a good degree. If they don't get a good degree, they will say, wait a minute, I paid £9,000. You haven't been teaching me properly. That's why I didn't get a good degree. So the number of student complaints has gone up because of that. In that sense, university education is now seen increasingly in some nation states as a tool necessary for gaining employment. And the purpose of the university as a whole is progressively focused on economic development. And this has led to changes in the curricula which now face much more on professional training rather than <coughs> personal development, empowerment and critical thought. What about society? How is academic freedom important to society? Academic freedom is indicative of a range of democratic values within the wider community. The rationale for guaranteeing freedom of speech in society is equally applicable to the university setting. So freedom of speech is necessary, firstly for democratic government, but also for what happens in the university. It is argued that academic freedom is not just for the benefit of the academics, or even of the institution. It is for the benefit of society at large. And in that sense, academic freedom is a right of the people rather than the privilege of the few. Having said that, it is very difficult to find any case studies which demonstrate that academic freedom has any direct societal benefits. Most academics only have a limited knowledge about academic freedom and know even less about the legal protection for academic freedom in their countries or about any academic freedoms that may operate in their universities themselves. So we now move on, last but not least, to actually look at students' academic freedom. Now, 
The idea about students having academic freedom assumed that some of the freedoms that staff may have could be transferable to students. But I've looked into this in great depth and I don't think that is the case. Going back to Humboldt, however, it is evident that students should have freedom to learn. And what I've tried to do is put together a group of proposals for freedom to learn for students. And if you have not done so already, if you now log into the web using the um, URL I gave, we will go through these one by one and you can voice your opinion. Okay? So, if you look at the academic literature, there's no agreement really on what students, whether students <coughs> So, for example, Peter Byrne argues that academic freedom should preserve, be preserved only for academics themselves. And quite a few people agree with that. Having said that, Metzger is a bit more positive about academic freedom, but if you look at what I've written up here, his argument says that there's no reason not to include students, rather than saying they should be included for a particular reason. And this argument seems to me to be very unbelievable. The European Students' Union has drafted the European Students' Charter. This contains 78 different statements, and many of the items in the Charter don't really refer to students. They refer more generally. So, for example, they include the right to affordable quality and suitable housing. Now, I would argue that's a basic human right, not a freedom for a student. Similarly, the right to nutritious and sustainable food, I think, is a right that extends way beyond the classroom. So, just as academic freedom for staff is a professional freedom, so should academic freedom for students relate to those activities that are concerned with the collaborative agreement between students and staff in the process of learning. So now let's look at some possible freedoms in detail. Here's the first one. Now, this may seem obvious to you, that you can choose exactly what you wish to study. Having said that, in some countries this is the case. Um, in the Warsaw Pact countries, for example, in places like Poland, before the uh, end of the USSR, students doing PhDs were told what subjects they should study in order to make sure that the study that they did was relevant to the national economy. And I mentioned previously in Saudi Arabia, there is some evidence to suggest that if you were to try and do a PhD in Saudi Arabia on, I don't know, the impact of the Saudi royal family, you would not get funding you would be forced to leave the country, basically. Um, so, it is the case that some people don't have that particular freedom. Now, if you logged into the net, you should be able to now voice your opinion on the extent to which you agree this is a freedom, and then thereafter, as to whether it's important. Do you all know the URL? I send them the emails, so I think you... So if you do have a computer, I would suggest you log in and start voicing your opinion. Is there a problem with that? Yeah. Uh, yeah? We'll have a look at more. So the second freedom I suggested is the freedom to apply to a university of your choice. Now in the United States, unusually, they operate, many universities operate, a system of affirmative action. And what this means is that they will try and promote equality and representation for groups who are socioeconomically deprived or may have suffered some degree of historical discrimination. That doesn't happen in Britain. I don't know whether it happens in Britain. <coughs> in India as well, they also have a system of affirmative action that provides historically disadvantaged groups with representation in higher now, it's worth asking as to whether this is a good idea. Having said that, we would all agree that students should not be denied entry on the basis of, for example, age, disability, ethnicity, first language, gender, marital status, nationality, parental status, etc., etc. And I think that goes for all of the freedoms we might consider for students. The next one you might think to be rather strange. The freedom to choose the language of instruction. 
As higher education has become much more global in scope, English has become the main language for academic research. So, for example, a journal like Scandinavian Political Studies is only published in English. It's always been the case that research publications have frequently been published in English owing to the influence of the USA, the United Kingdom, and those countries the United Kingdom used to control, like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. More recently, new technologies have enabled students to learn at a distance, which has meant that English is now regarded as a language for teaching as well as research. So, for example, if I look at Finland, Finland has a language that is like no other apart from Hungarian. There are only 5.5 million Finns. If you are producing a PhD in Finland, unless you're doing it in Finnish literature, you will do it in English. Let's say you did a thesis in engineering. There are probably only three or 4,000 engineers in Finland who might read it. If you put it into English, it will be read globally across the world. It is now also the case, however, that in Finland they're now running courses that are only taught in English. So even Finnish students have to learn in English. And you could argue this puts them at a disadvantage. In fact, universities used to be guardians of national literature and language, but less so now today. But you might ask yourself, let's say you had to be taught this particular award in another language, not English, it could be anything, French. Would that be fair and appropriate? Freedom to learn in one, one's own way. Now, inherent in the idea of freedom of expression is the ability to make informed decisions. Within most EU states, the underlying teaching and learning strategy in universities is very participative. Students are encouraged to voice their opinions, which is why I want you to do that survey. Having said that, the student engagement movement acts to restrict the learning choices made by students. Compulsory attendance registers, class contribution grading, and group projects take little account of the rights of students or differences between them. What I would refer to as the hidden curriculum is intolerant to students who may prefer to learn informally, who may be reticent and shy, or simply value their own privacy. Freedom to participate on the campus. All students have the right to participate in campus activities which provide an additional facet to their personal development. For example, the ability to invite guest speakers on particular topics can be an important part of the academic experience. Having said that, even these activities may be subject to university regulations or also, also national laws. So in the United Kingdom, for example, you could not start a riot if you were arrested. Right of access to university facilities. Students have a right to access all the teaching facilities that may be crucial to their own learning processes. And also the right to access sports and social facilities like the students' bar and restaurants. Freedom from biased teaching. All students are entitled to equal access to teaching material and teaching methods that are free from any particular professional bias. Whether this particular liberty can be enjoyed is dependent on academic style. Thus, this freedom is conditional upon the actions of other people rather than the students. The right to academic support and pastoral care. For many students, learning at universities can be an exceedingly challenging experience. Not just because they provide find it difficult to learn, but they may also have personal problems and financial worries. In the United Kingdom, for example, the number of student suicides rose from 75 in 2007 to 134 in 2015, and it's gone up since then. So a large number of young students are having real problems that they've committed suicide as a result. Right to unbiased assessment. <coughs> Most student assessments are very traditional. You know, for example, a time honored way of doing it is with a time constrained, time student paper for examination. It may be that one student prefers one method of assessment over another. 
So where possible, a varied diet of assessment should be used to ensure no students are disadvantaged. And the same goes for grading. Students have a right to ensure their assessments are graded purely on the basis of their academic excellence and not subject to positive or negative bias. This can be actually pursued through calibration and double marking with the long-term aim of fully anonymizing marking. Studies that have been done have demonstrated very clearly that there is a gender bias in favour of males when it comes to the grading of university assessments. There's no dispute in that. But if you don't like the grade that you've got, you should also have the right of external opinion. I don't know if that exists in Italy, but in the United Kingdom, for example, students do have the right for an external to come in and remark a paper if they feel they need to or treated. Freedom of expression. In most European countries, we tend to take freedom of expression for granted. But in other countries, there are limits on freedom of expression. In China, for example, the authorities deliberately created their own version of Twitter. It's called Weibo. The Chinese students can use it. Similarly, Renren is the Chinese equivalent to Facebook. Having said that, as the slide indicates here, there are limits to freedom of expression. More particularly, you should not have things like libel, slander, obscenity, etc. etc. The right to participation in governance. The extent to which students can participate in governance, as I've addressed earlier, varies between countries and between universities in different nation states. For historical reasons, in Latin America, university students not only have the right to participate in governance, but they also appear on vetting panels when uh, academics are considered for promotion. So they're very powerful. And finally, probably the most contentious of all, freedom to have a university education with no fees at all. The 1966 International Covenant indicated that in the longer term, different nation states should proceed towards having free education at university level. In the United Kingdom, we've gone completely the other way. And it is now the case that most students have to pay £9,000 a year. So, now you need to take the online survey. If you'd like to do that, there's the link. And what I will now do is come out of here and look at the results. I said I'd take an hour. Two minutes. I'm good. <laughs> Has anyone completed the survey at all? Anyone? According to this, none of you have done it. Shall we give them a few minutes? Yeah. Because actually, in my head, I told them, don't do it right. until the first part of the class is finished. So okay. I think they have just done the homework. <laughs> so. Let's, let's give them a little time. I'll reload the page when we're going to say. Nothing is happening. Ah! There we go. So, here's the first one. Students should be free to choose the subject they wish to study. No one here says they disagree with it at all. <laughs> and most of you think it's either very important or absolutely vital. Let's look at the next one. Students should have the freedom. Absolutely, look, 69% of you strongly agree with that, so that's no contentious. And you all think it's pretty important. Only 7% think it's important. Uh, this is slightly different. 50% of it, but it's still very, very positive. 
14%, one person in seven, doesn't really know, is not really sure. See how important these ones. Very important to cyber in your study. Language. Very important. Any agreement is well, a third of you are not really sure about this one, whether you should be free to learn your preferred way. But most of you think it's important. <coughs> this is not surprising. 80% of you think that you should have the freedom to participate in campus activities. And you think it's vitally important or absolutely vital for that. 93 7% strongly disagree with this. I'm very wrong. I already agree and I'll put it. <laughs> well, I'll go past that quickly then. And you all say it's absolutely vital. <clears throat> again, 7%. Is that you again? Uh, no, I don't think okay. so. 7% <laughs> strongly disagree with that. Most of it's that very, very important. So then, again, 7% said, well, 21% said it was of, of average or little important. <coughs> you all agree that um, pastoral care should be provided. And you all think it's important. Bias again, all of you think it's vital, most of you. And also, you should have unbiased assessment. Look at that, 71% feel that you should have the right to a fair and unbiased grading. And all, well, a large number of you think it's kind of very important and vital. Most of you think that you should have the right of appeal, it's grading. Although 7% again disagree, don't know who that was. And you all think, well, most of you think it's important. Although 15%, 30% they say it's of average or little importance. Maybe it's because that doesn't happen very much. Freedom of expression, you all think it's a good idea. Governance, less important matter. Here, see, 8% there disagree with the idea that university education should be provided without a charge. And over 70% think it's very important or absolutely vital. So it's quite interesting to see exactly what you came up with. Can any of you think of any other freedoms that you think students should be given? I mean, I try very hard to work out what students should have in terms of the right to learn. Can you think of any others that you've come across? Anyone? No answer was the firm reply. None at all. I mean, I gave you 11. Can you think of any others that might be important? What about the ability to have a job while studying? Do, do any of you have jobs while you're studying? Most students in the United Kingdom now work part time because, because of the fees. Do you have any other ideas about what students should, what kind of rights students should have? Anyone? <coughs> no? I think there's one, if I can just step in, there is one freedom that might encounter when they move to the second part of the class, which is the, the, the part of the course related to advocacy. And they would work on students who have been arrested or persecuted because they participated in two extramural uh, utterance. So, and, and often students ask, I mean, why is this 
why participating into a protest or a manifestation about certain issues that may be related directly to freedom of teaching or research, but might be also related to broader human rights or other concerns. And if you are persecuted, why is this a violation of academic freedom? I think right. it's a tricky question we often encounter also in previous courses. Right. I don't know if you agree. I mean, mm -hmm. In the, in the UK, there's a big issue now of, of LGBTQ rights. Mm. Students are often, for example, disinviting people. And that is it's quite a big issue for us. Mm. But you are the person who mm. chatted with you. You're the rapporteur or the respondent? Yeah. I mean, they started the discussion. Yeah. Actually, actually yeah, I, I should have introduced you both, but it doesn't work. You can't fit. You have to introduce yourself and go. Yeah. 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 Because, as you may know, um, Belarus has a quite turbulent history, contemporary history, and uh, after the election of August 2020, um, the civil society actually raised up and go protest in the streets. And students were a really active part in this, in this kind of protest, and they were the ones who suffered among the most. Uh, of the oppressions of the regime, and many of them were forced to, to leave the country. Uh, so, with my, with my thesis, I get a chance to, to interview some of them and to collect their experiences, and so also to reflect on the meaning of academic freedom, on the threats to academic freedom, uh, and also the, the differences uh, in different contexts in academic freedom, because, of course, uh, made, uh, so far we have talked about the European context, which is quite a privileged one. Uh, but when we go outside, for example, in countries where uh, there are no established democracy, there are, uh, yeah, for example, authoritarian regimes and so on, of course the, the, situation, the situation is completely different and also new issues arise. Uh, so, uh, concerning the, the lecture today, um, well, it was very dense, and uh, oh, very that was, <laughs> the topic also was very dense, and uh, I think it was really useful because it summarizes uh, all the main aspects and points related to academic freedom, uh, points that when I studied literature for my thesis, uh, I was quite uh, disoriented and lost sometimes, uh, because we know that academic freedom is a very complex concept, uh, there is no clear shared definition of it, uh, but what we can find are different elements, different dimensions, um, which are still like, vividly like, discussed uh, in the literature. Um, so, uh, thinking about yeah, um, the, the presentation, I maybe have like, two uh, points, uh, two observations. Uh, the first is related to the, the meaning and the definition of student academic freedom, I completely agree um, on the fact that students are um, entitled to academic freedom, but this academic freedom is different from academics. Uh, but actually, I practically like, disagree on the fact that uh, student academic freedom should be labeled as only uh, freedom of uh, learning. Um, Indeed, uh, and this is not, not also not, not only maybe my, my opinion, but this is something I also found during my interview with students. Mm -hmm. uh, because during my interview with them, I um, asked them like their experiences in the Belarusian higher education system, so their daily life in the university, uh, the courses, the relationship with professors, and so on. And at the end of the interview, I always ask, "What is student academic freedom for them?" 
uh, and they gave me many answers, uh, they gave me different inputs and that, uh, I summarized that like in uh, six main dimensions, so to say. Uh, three of these dimensions are quite similar to what we have discussed so far. So, for example, the first was the right to an independent and student-centered learning. Uh, and this was because, uh, as, uh, as you were mentioning before, Belarus is one of the cases in which uh, students cannot choose the courses. Mm -hmm. The study plan is predetermined at the government level. Uh, so they have to follow the courses that are mandatory, so they cannot even choose to do not go to the, uh, to the classes, but they have to be there in presence every day, otherwise they can also be charged with a fine, for example. Uh, then they also recognize the, the freedom to teach of professors, so there is this sort of uh, binding between uh, teaching and learning, which should be like both uh, together, uh, and also the freedom of, of censorship. Uh, because, of course, Belarus is an authoritarian state, so the most sensitive topic, the most uh, political topic, cannot be discussed in the classroom. So they really recognize the value of also uh, bringing the, the contemporary issue and the sensitive issue in the, in the university classrooms. Uh, then, related to this dimension, they also mentioned, for example, the <coughs> research, both for students and, and academics, and also the access to international opportunity, for example, so the, the possibility to go for an Erasmus program, uh, bilateral agreement, and so on. Uh, but they also mentioned other three aspects which I think are really, really interesting. The first is the right to uh, participate in university governance, yeah. not only in the matter of uh, learning, for instance, but uh, I was quite surprised because many of them actually um, claim the right to um, choose the rector for example. Uh, and more in general, they really emphasize the fact that they want the right to promote change in the university, to be heard, uh, to be respected from teachers and from the administrative staff, and to really uh, provide their point of view, their point of perspective. Because they really, uh, some of them uh, clearly told me that we are the one who knows that what we need to improve the university. Professors cannot know this as better as, as us, for example. Uh, so this was a really uh, pressing issue, pressing issue and, uh, and, and this is something that goes beyond, I think, the, 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 learning, uh, the learning process. Um, another interesting element was the institutional autonomy of the university, for instance, so uh, of course that the regime should not be, uh, should not interfere with the teaching activities and the research activities, so uh, the autonomy from the original regime, and lastly, also they recognize the, that academic freedom is interdependent with the other personal rights and individual freedoms. Uh, so uh, the fact that they are in, a, in an authoritarian context, of course, heavily affected the fact that they also experience academic freedom violations. Uh, so they are really aware of the fact that, uh, of course, without a change in, in the regime and in the political system also academic freedom kind of truly improve uh, for them. Um, so th this is my first point and maybe my first question uh, is that if you agree, but also students, if you agree with, on the fact that um, student academic freedom should include more, should go beyond, like we could say, freedom of, of learning and include maybe also the student political right and student right to participate in the university um, yeah, I would say governance, and, and so through their representatives, but also as single individuals who has maybe opinion and want to express them. Uh, so maybe, yeah, this is my, my, my first point. I have another one, okay, maybe we can discuss. Uh, yeah, go on. Okay, so and, uh, in, the, the second point is that, is that um, I, I often feel that there is a sort of uh, tendency towards like, the um, we usually talk about, for example, academic freedom for scholars and academic freedom for students, as these are two like separated uh, entities, for example. Uh, but what I think um, it's really important and also emerged as very important, for example, in my interviews, is also the relational dimension of academic freedom, uh, meaning that this right is um, granted in the daily life of the university. 
campuses in the university life, and it's realized, for example, through the face to face interactions between professors and students, between professors and between students, and also um, in the various academic exchange, the, the conferences, and, and so on. Um, so um, maybe I was wondering if it could be useful for us to try to uh, unpack, better unpack this aspect and try to uh, really um, focus on this relational uh, communitarian dimension of academic freedom. And if you really think that, that, that it's important, how can we uh, strengthen this, for example? How can we reinforce this? On the, also based on the, our daily life in the university. So these are my two points. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that students' participation because quite frequently in the UK, when it comes to student elections, not many people actually vote. Uh, it's a great shame that that's not the thing to say. And maybe because they're very much uh, consumerist in that respect. I don't really know what that is. But in other places, um, students are actually on the board of governors of the university. Again, it depends on the information sets. So some places do take it very seriously about having students have a major role in the governance of the institution itself. And again, in Latin America, for historical reasons, they're definitely very, very, in a very powerful position. You know, they all want a student's rights. Just don't have any respect. So it, it does vary considerably. Again, this comes back to what you said before about there being no agreement with respect to what constitutes that degree. And there's no agreement really with the way in which it's going to be dealt with. Um, but I do think, as you said, as you say, the student should be given a greater right in respect of governance, perhaps they have in the past. But that may be difficult to achieve in some particular European states where there's been a move towards the university becoming much more autonomous in terms of its management and much less participative with respect not only to staff but also to students. As I indicated, it's now the case that in many countries, Finland's a good example, a large number of members of the board now are external. And quite often they, they know very little about how the university operates. So for example, at my, at my own university we had a guy who called Gunners, and he was the owner of the largest pig farm in Lincolnshire. Now, if, you know, I knew more about pigs than he did about higher education days. You know, he just didn't know But he was brought in because he was a major in the market. Simple as that. And where you have uh, governors who don't have any expertise in higher education, it's clear that the rector can put forward views that they don't know about and therefore can't challenge. So it looks as though governance has been shifted towards being much more concerned with the role of the university in terms of making money and being part of the world. And that also affects the students. In the United Kingdom, of this, they tend to be much more now concerned with not the process of education, but the outcome. What class of degree are we going to get? Is it going to get me a job in this time? And universities in the United Kingdom have the proportion of their graduates who go into employment monitored. And if less than 70% of our students go into a job within a year, will they criticize for it? That has nothing to do with us, but that does happen. I suspect the situation in Europe, elsewhere, other than the UK, is different. And there's not that much emphasis as there is in the United Kingdom. But again, the UK is only following the United States in this. Sorry, what was the first point you, you made? What was that about? Uh, yeah, no, the, the first point was about yeah, um, a broader, maybe, conceptualization of student academic freedom. So, yeah, participation in governance and the, uh, the inclusion of also students' political rights. Yeah, but do you not think political rights for students are part of kind of broader freedoms anyway, democratic freedoms? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the point of being like, academic freedom being interdependent with other, with other freedom and rights, but uh, the fact that they should be also protected within the university, so the right to, uh, for example, I don't know, organize conferences yeah. or maybe really contemporary and sensitive issues yeah. uh, or the right to, to, to organize protests and other kind of, of uh, yeah, 
activities to, uh, to present a point of view, or maybe also to, to ask the university to take side or to take action in front of some situations uh, that for students are important, for instance. Yeah, no, so I think most, most people would agree with that, yes. Well, most students would agree with that, that's the case. Having said that, the, the distinction between academic freedom and freedom of speech is often quite blurred. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the problem, I don't know, but insofar as they're clearly very different. So, academic freedom is professional freedom, which enables certain people to express an opinion to a, an audience that's been chosen on the basis of their academic merit in order to teach them. Whereas freedom of expression is a freedom granted to everyone in which they can air their particular opinions on particular topics, which may be of no importance whatsoever. And in fact, for example, you could use freedom of expression as comedians do, to not tell the truth, but just to make people laugh. Whereas you, know, you can't do that in academia. You have to tell the truth, basically. But your point about Belgium is interesting, because in Belgium you've got Flemish-speaking universities, and also French-speaking. And you mentioned the lack of choice, and it may be the fact, because Belgium is such a small country, and it's divided. In fact, there is a German enclave as well. I can't remember if it has your university. So it may be the choices that students have are circumscribed just by the scale of higher education in those countries. Okay, so maybe we can, first of all, I think we can thank both. Uh,